Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. I am your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for stopping by for this latest episode of Good Trouble, the series where I engage in above-the-table conversations that I feel are necessary in the board gaming space in a spirit of education and compassion. So this is episode 2B, a direct follow-up to 2A, uh, in this series that I am calling a Real Talk About Racism. Uh, so this is my attempt to uh, synthesize and summarize 40 episodes, uh, common threads that I that get picked up throughout all 40 episodes as I attempt to bridge divides, speak to people who are on my side, help to illuminate some issues, but also speak to people with whom I disagree, people on the other side, trying to figure out you know what they're saying, what their uh, issues are, and coming up with my own responses. Uh, both in kindness, which was part one, and also part two, offering, you know, perspective that might be a little bit difficult to hear, a little bit of, uh, you know, a bitter medicine, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so that was uh, part 2A, and part 2B is a continuation of that. Uh, please go ahead and check the previous videos. I'm going to uh, go to kind of speed through the promo. Uh, I am Shelf Stories. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, spread the word, uh, and let's get right into uh, episode 2B, which pushes forward this medicine, real talk about racism. In episode 2A, uh, I shared a, what I called an uncomfortable truth uh, uh, about these conversations about racism, which is that uh, the very definition of racism is fraught and misunderstood. Uh, I described how um, you know, we mean it on the marginalized side. We tend to mean it one way and then speaking across the divide towards this construction that I am calling nice, moderate white folks, uh, that the understanding tends to be a little bit more truncated and limited on that other end. Uh, in the sense that, you know, on that, uh, you know, nice, moderate side, I often hear racism understood in purely interpersonal terms. So one person hating another person, one person intending meaning harm to another person. It's almost like uh, there can't be racisms outside of that context. At least that's how that's understood across the divide. Here, we're trying to articulate a much broader reality because it is a reality for us. We're the victims. Uh, we're <laughs> we're the, uh, historically and ongoing uh, if you look at it, especially through a systemic lens. You'll hear that a lot, systemic racism. Uh, what that means is the systemic denial and theft of wealth resources to go along with the interpersonal hatred. So we're trying to have uh, that bigger discussion, but it gets filtered through the lens of feelings. And that's what creates a lot of difficulty. Summing up a whole 40 minutes of video right there. So then paying it forward, it's actually um, another truth that's attached to it and a little bit more direct. It is not just the definition of racism that gets warped in that feelings interpretation. The second uncomfortable truth, this, this does not make me happy to share this, and I know I'm risking a lot uh, by, you know, kind of putting myself out there like this. But I truly feel that in, in uh, directly addressing nice, moderate white guys, that your feelings are actually one of the, if not the biggest impediments to broader change. Wow. <laughs> of all the things, right? Of all the historical things, I'm I'm isolating nice, moderate white feelings. The people who I play with, the people who are around my table and I go to cons with, and, you know, from one lens, perfectly nice people that I get to play with, but from another lens, this huge problem that causes all this oppression, all that kind of stuff. How does that track, Jason? I want to isolate uh, the feelings aspect, but I also want to isolate, in particular, fear. Nice, smart white guys are the center of the hobby. And as people, fine. But your fear, when triggered or when tingled, is what gets in the way. Fear of what? Sometimes fear of our presence, and that becomes a problem in and of itself. Sometimes fear of change. There's, uh, you know, this is a pretty uh, well-known uh, reality, uh, this thing that we call moral panic, 
when societal things change, you know, you're, you grow up with something, you're used to something, and all of a sudden, like, something changes demographically or physically in the environment. There's this panic that sets in. Oh, my God, I'm going to lose something. It triggers deep loss aversion. And it might not be actually true, but ugh, it's almost like kind of drowning in a shallow pool. You, you go in the pool and you're splashing. Oh, my God, I'm, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And then it's like, stand up. You're good. You stand up and you're in uh, like four feet of water. And it was fine. But that moment, that moment of I don't know, I've lost control, that's where I'm talking about when it comes to that sense of panic that sets in when things change. And things are changing. This is not the same hobby as it was in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, you know, and things are changing from the perspective of the nice moderate white folk pretty rapidly. You know, uh, Puerto Rico was okay as, as late as 2015, and now it's not okay anymore. Uh, and I isolate Puerto Rico a lot. <laughs> Sorry about that. But there's all sorts of games that were okay and all sorts of things. That, I mean, we're not even talking about games. We're talking about things in a wider society. You know, up until recently, Aunt Jemima was okay. Up until recently, we could fly Confederate flags in NASCAR. We could do the chop out of, you know, the baseball game. We could do, uh, you know, say certain things, do certain things. And very uh, relatively quickly over the last, you know, five or some odd years, so much has changed and it is triggering this sense of resistance, panic, feelings. And the contention is that that causes as much or more resistance to positive change, change that maybe you say you want, like a multicultural uh, you know, idea, like a, a better realization of multiculturalism here in our community and in the wider world, but that resistance to change is actually frustrating progress more than anything on the board. So what is this board? Uh, it actually goes into the title of the video, which is the chess game. And it is my allegory for uh, explaining as best as I can how it is that I can say that nice white moderate guy fear is the significant impediment to you know marginalized folks making progress. Okay, so let's go with chess. And in chess, you know, hopefully people, this is a gaming channel, people are familiar, right? Uh, in a regular game of chess, it is symmetric. You have your power pieces and your pawns and the, everybody has the same side. And, you know, uh, then there's a, you know, a battle of wits, equal or unequal. In society, that is not how it works. Because of racism, because of the denial of and theft of uh, resources and opportunity, we start at a disadvantage. Fewer pieces, fewer capacity, looking at a full range, a whole range of different aspects of the culture that are there to defend white centrality. And I'll go piece by piece in the allegory, <laughs> see if everybody vibes uh, what I'm putting out here. Okay, so the king, the center, you know, the thing that is in charge. Of the whole board capture that piece and everything topples, but that thing isn't getting captured anytime soon, at least uh, on our end. The king represents what a sociologist named C. Wright Mills called the power elite. So these are the heads of government, heads of state, way, way, way above our pay grade, the people that actually run the show, which happen to be nice, moderate white guys, a lot of them. <laughs> You know, so it's like I'm talking to a, this construction, the nice moderate white guy. That is an example of, of folks who rule the world. So like the only thing that separates him from a lot of people watching this video are a whole bunch of zeros uh, in their bank account. And it's a really good example of the separation that I make uh, between the person and the practice. So I'm showing Bill Gates right here. Bill Gates is famous for all the help, the philanthropic work, the investments in, you know, different diseases or, uh, you know, curing diseases in uh, developing countries, uh, going to the poorest countries and helping out there. I'm not taking anything away from the man's personal philanthropic work, and I'm not saying anything about his heart. However, policies that uh, folks like that pursue, and this is across a lot of the power elite, those policies have racial impacts. This man who has done so much to alleviate disease 
in developing countries is pursuing a policy to keep vaccines behind patent protection and not help the rest of the developing world develop their own vaccines so that people can you know, actually get vaccinated and we can finally get past this dumb COVID deal. Folks like that are stopping what's happening for their own personal profit and for the integrity of intellectual property. That policy is racist. It has racist impact. You don't have to be a racist to pursue a policy that's racist. And we can go down the line of the things that the power elite do to maintain control of society and the society benefits them in certain ways and disadvantages folks in other ways. We want to be able to talk about that. That's the king. Let's move on down the line. Let's go to the bishop. In my allegory, the bishop are uh, represents the culture producers. Uh, the bishop uh, represents knowledge production, uh, idea dissemination. It represents education, cultural uh, production. Uh, the bishop uh, is because in you know, way back in the day, uh, in the medieval times, that uh, the cultural production came from religious sources. You know, they were the artists and the, a lot of the art, a lot of the music and everything was, you know, very religious centered. We progressed to a much different era of our society. Uh, but, you know, the idea of, you know, cultural production of reproduction of ideas comes, uh, you know, we still have that. We still have, you know, uh, people who produce that stuff, but there tend to be more along the, uh, you know, the artists and the celebrities uh, and, you know, media, that kind of thing and cultural, uh, cultural production. And in our little corner, I talk about games as cultural products, folks who make the games and uh, dis continue to disseminate cultural ideas, produce little bits of culture that we do in our games. So that's all encompassed in the uh, idea of the bishop. Move on down. Now we're going to get a little bit uh, direct and aggressive here. The horse are the actual racists. Horse is the uh, folks in society who have power or who use whatever uh, uh, they have to directly hate and oppress and you know participate in uh, actively, enthusiastically in some kind of uh, instantiation of power. Back in the day, I'm going to use the horse because, you know, those were the old slave catchers. In uh, you know, middle century, uh, 18th century America, they would sell, they would be either self-drafted or hired on by, you know, uh, uh, the property owners and, you know, chase down slaves. And, you know, that's a very common trope. And unfortunately, still goes on Ugh. Uh, nowadays. Well, I'll get to that situation in just a second. And by the way, I did mention Haiti in the last video. It all comes back. But it's not just racism. Anybody who uses their power and you, you operates along their, uh, you know, their idea of hierarchy, you know, this above this and this above this and has power, can execute that power. It's also included on here. So, you know, I haven't talked much about women in these episodes, but I have that in mind because there are a lot of powerful harassers, molesters, rapists that are a part of this too because they're operating on that hierarchical thinking me here with the power you there you exist uh, as a uh, function of me to please me that is the the horse figure those actual racist patriarchy all the people that actively do this stuff move on down you get to the rook in chess, the pieces protect one another, right? You set things up, and this covers this, this covers this, this covers this. In a way, the rook plays that ultimate protection because they are the courts, the law, the policies. They, um, in this construction, so I showed before the, the, the guy on a horse leading you know, a migrant down, well... These people wouldn't be able to get away with what they do if it wasn't for structures that, that protect them, that erase accountability, that favor them. And, you know, so that's where it gets baked into law and policy. And so, you know, if you're thinking about like a judge figure, that's what I'm talking about with, you know, that rook. 
And so you see how different aspects of the society are kind of like lined up. And they, in, in their own ways, kind of instantiate that white supremacy that we're of that we're dealing with. And I'm dealing with white, and I'm talking about white supremacy, not like accusing anybody of anything, but in terms of just the overall outlay of what we're facing. Nothing else to call it because there's so much power lined up against us. And then you have the pawns. Who are the pawns? Uh, the pawns don't do a ton of direct damage like the power pieces do. All the power pieces in some way do direct damage in all their own different ways. They are the Reddit trolls, online trolls, uh, folks who, once again, the people that actually do the harm are the power pieces, but these are the ones that are the harassers that are threatening harm. Maybe they're just piping up and derailing conversations. Uh, maybe they're popping up on people's DMs. And there's a lot of harassment that happens on DMs, people. Do not be fooled. We don't share it, but it absolutely is a reality. These are the harassers. These are the pawns. They don't do anything or, or too much that's impactful, but they are there to drain and to cause misdirection and to make the the progressing of our positions that much more difficult in their harrying and their harassment. They are the pawns, the harassers, the loud people, the annoying people. <sighs> <laughs> and they do a really good job of that. I can tell you that from personal experience. So I'm left with the queen. Who's the queen? You figured it out. Nice, moderate, white guy. Fear. Distinguishing. Not you necessarily, but when you're tingled and triggered, your sense of moral panic or your sense that you don't like that are changes, that is that becomes the fear that gets in the way. Why the queen? Of all the pieces on the board, the queen can go basically anywhere she wants. And, you know, in this uh, kind of allegory that I'm constructing, it's almost like a cheating queen. It can literally go to any space. It doesn't matter if it's off the diagonal or off the horizontal. That queen appears everywhere. White moderate guys have something to say about everything, literally everything. And I don't like using overgeneralizations, but I can't think of a single change that is that is pushed forward in society where uh, some nice, moderate white folks have nothing to say. It's always something to say. And here's something that's very important for us to uh, express from uh, our side of the marginalized perspectives. Uh, not only does it feel like the white moderate fear queen go anywhere and do, say anything, but it seems to have an extra special power of out of turn, a free movement, direct, prophylactic, uh, defensive intercession. So then we're trying to make our moves. We're trying to challenge pieces. Y'all got plenty of pieces to challenge. Here comes the queen defending any piece that he thinks is being unjustly attacked. So then uh, you know, we're trying to talk about the different harassers, the pawns, the legion all over the place. Uh, you know, they're saying racist, sexist, homophobic stuff. Uh, they're make, engaging in behaviors that y'all white modern folks would never do. You don't, you don't approve of those behaviors yourself. But then when it comes to the actual person, well, let's talk to them. Let's, uh, you know, they maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they d just don't know. Or they've been like that the whole time. They're just joking. Don't worry about that. That's just the way they are. Focus on the table. All gamers are welcome at the table. And if you have a problem with that, then that is your problem. Check. Goes a little bit up the chain. Talk about the production of games themselves. And I see games as cultural products that, you know, you know, in a piece with books and movies and plays and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, we're trying on POC perspective to call some stuff out. Oh, hey, that's a that's cultural appropriation. You're taking stuff that without giving credit to the original source. Or that's a stereotype. You know, you're producing something and you're making it harder for me as the person you're stereotyping to be authentically seen. Wait a minute, that sounds like you're constraining creators or guilting audiences. You're telling people what to do. You're taking away their stuff. Uh, I don't, you know, that's not the way we should be as a free society. They have the right to make whatever they want without all this wokeness cancellation stuff. Check. 
you go further, you know, you can go you know, different levels of policy, as I've been talked about in the previous videos, uh, and, you know, or <laughs> I should talk about these people, the actual molesters, the actual people who do harm. Well, you can't just accuse people of something. So what if this person just poured out a long blog with their, you know, poured their soul out, made themselves vulnerable? So what about that? They have no proof, innocent until proven guilty. Check. Uh, the police, the individual police who perform acts of brutality all the time, they had all the cover in the world because they couldn't be filmed for the longest time. Now we're putting them on film and even on the film. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, uh, we can't reform the police. Defund the police? What are you talking about? That sounds scary. Who's going to answer 911? No reforms for anybody whatsoever. Check. <laughs> The criticism of history facts themselves. Uh, America, you know, or whatever country talking about, the, you know, having a reckoning with, you know, ethnic hatred and, you know, interpersonal, intergroup hatred, all these things that should be talked about. Uh, and we're trying to just, you know, reflect actual history. Wait a minute. Are you saying America is racist? Are you trying to make my kids feel like they're bad people for being American and for having white skin? Check, 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 check. Everywhere that I can think of uh, is some kind of reaction. Check. Oh, I'm over here. Check. I'm over here. Check. Go through my entire catalog of good trouble. And I've had people that have said this. Jason, every single video, you are constantly placating. You're reassuring. And it's a little annoying to watch because I am very conscious that I of who I'm speaking to. And I am very conscious, even as careful as I am. That I'll get, Jason, you're attacking. Jason, you're using these terms. Dude, you're doing this. You're doing this. I try so hard. <sighs> so hard. Not just to communicate, but to try to create change. So at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And I'm very conscious that it is the white moderate folks who are the center of hobby that need to be on board in order to get that change. And so having to deal with those feelings on a consistent basis over 40 videos and over a lot in my life takes a lot out of you. It certainly takes a lot out of me. And I am not the only one that feels this way. First, I must, must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the letter from Birmingham Jail, do yourself a favor and check it out. The essence of what is being asked for on your side, uh, that moderate peace, let's just play games. What's it for? Is it uh, a desire out of an active peace or is it a desire to forget 
and smooth over tensions without really dealing with them and just engage in some kind of sense of order. An order that works for you doesn't work for me as much. And I'll be really real. I am blessed. I have games. I could if I wanted to. Just forget all this stuff and play. I have that privilege as a male and all and lighter skin and all sorts of stuff. I can. But in my life experience, in my work, in my family, the things that I have seen working in jails, working in foster care, uh, working in some of the most difficult areas of my life, places place where, honestly, I feel at home as a social worker, as a professional, just a human being, helping marginalized folks. I can't let go of that. I want to come into the gaming space and, and take a break and just play a game. But then I come in and I see some pretty rough stereotypes. I see difficult behavior, exclusionary behavior. I see a hobby that is very much class-centered and shooting upwards relative to the price and all in Kickstarters. Uh, the, I see these trends and I can't let them go. So that's causing tension. It's pressing on the wounds of society by opening your table and saying, let's just play games. We're ignoring all of that for the sake of order, and not peace. So here we are. I have taken the nice, moderate, white guy construction and I have dismantled or tried to dismantle so much of it. Nice, I don't want your niceness. Niceness without kindness is not going to work for me. Kindness is direct and I was very direct. Niceness smooths things over. Nice, out of here. Moderate, let's just play games. (laughs) Taking that out. Taking out all those qualifiers and trying to really have a conversation with a person. And hopefully there's enough left there and I have a lot of faith that there is, you know, good hearted people that want to, you know, uh, that want to see things changed or want to see things changed in a way that works for them, that doesn't like take things away from them. Um, You know, hopefully there's enough left there that we can have a conversation. And I can help you articulate how you can really help that Let's Just Play Games does not help. So it would be a pretty big ask to go after any of the power pieces. And that is not something that I necessarily will you know, put down a table. If you want to, go ahead. Take on the power elite. Take on the harassers and the protectors of the harassers. Go ahead if you want to. But the very least, the pawns the individual little bits of harassment that we encounter uh, uh, frequently, the possible harasser that is sitting at your table. Uh, And, you know, maybe harasser is a strong word, but the person who may mean well, but they drop the occasional racist joke or, you know, they have exclusionary behaviors. They make women feel uncomfortable. uh, They, you know, just are exclusionary. You know, that, that in its own way, maybe even unconsciously enforces the the hobby to look a certain way because you know we don't want to be around that because that that kind of thing can drive us from the hobby so if you can you know, find it in your heart to you know take out or at least take on a pawn or two on our behalf every little bit counts or if you don't want to play if that's not something that is comfortable then i don't even mind that either what i'd ask is charitable interpretation of what we're trying to do. If so many people that say, oh, I can't believe this. Why do I have to talk about this again? No politics, whatever it is. That's not interpreting our position charitably, what we're trying to uh, accomplish charitably. And so I'd like to drill down on that point of charitable interpretation for just a second, because it's so many ways. That's the problem. You know, we like to talk about, oh, we need to listen to each other. Well, we don't need to listen to each other. I think we're hearing each other just fine. I think we need to charitably interpret one another a little bit better. 
uh, in the last video, I described how uh, the two sides don't understand the word racism the same way. So what happens when there's a miss there? It's like, you know, uh, the, the, you hit that friction point and that's where the sparks fly. We're not getting together. We're just doing that. And we can zoom that out to so much of this, these discussions, you know, so nice, smart, right, folks, uh, you know, are trying to contribute. Y'all are trying to help. You're you're for this stuff. I get that comment all the time. I hear you, but dot dot dot. And can't you understand that I you know just want to play a game or whatever it is? So do we. You're asking for a charitable interpretation of your stance. We want to provide that three videos in. I hopefully have laid the groundwork. As difficult as that is, I'm continuing the conversation. That is charitable interpretation for me. If I'm willing to provide it, I think I can ask for folks on that side to give it. If you ask for it, be willing to give it. When we speak up, when we use our voices, please feel free to check your feelings that arise. Check your discomfort, perhaps the moral sense of panic that's coming up. And as opposed to reacting off of that and feeling like you can just, I'm going to spout off off of my feelings because the society has said your feelings are always valid. Please express them. Okay, I'm not invalidating them, but just check them and see if your feelings are causing you to misinterpret what we're saying. That's what charitable interpretation is all about. So in terms of a move forward, you know, if you're not going to you know, go back, push back against any of the pieces, which would be great, but everybody's in a different space in their life, that's fine. If you can at least provide the thing you're asking for, which is charitable interpretation of our side and say, you know what? Okay, they have something to say. They probably have a real reason to express it. Then, you know, I'll either sit this one out or try to learn more or something like that. That in and of itself would be so, so helpful. And we are not above, you know, uh, criticism. There's a lot of things that we do on our side that go up across the pale. We do, you know, uh, there's folks on my side that do all the things that I say not to do, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, make things personal and make things emotional and make things direct and, you know, start an attack, bring more heat than light. We do that plenty in spades. So, you know, the door is open for y'all to criticize as well. I will ask for one thing though. And once again, one more time, another person has said it better than I can. And let's get, let's get a couple things straight, just a little side note. The burden of the brutalized is not to comfort the bystander. That's not our job, all right, stop with all that. If you have a critique for the resistance, for our resistance, and you better have an established record of critique of our oppression. If you have no interest, if you have no interest in equal rights for black people, then do not make suggestions to those who do. Sit down. So that was the African-American actor, Jesse Williams, at a recent uh, award speech. Very, very noteworthy moment for us. Uh, if you want to criticize our resistance, then have a record of criticizing our oppression. And I have provided over three videos, a record of our, our oppression, at least a framework for understanding it. And then, you know, hopefully you're empowered to kind of look back at so much of our history and so much of the sociology and what's happening and see our oppression in a real way. It's not just a bunch of people hating on, on one another. It is that, but there's a whole nother material level that uh, constitutes that record. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I talk about racism. Racism is not just, uh, you know, a top level politics issue that, you know, we can check in and out of. For us, it's a kitchen table issue. And well, in a real way, it's a game table issue too. Talk on that level, at least be willing to grapple on that level. Then we welcome your criticisms. We welcome speaking. But there's a big if hanging on that. Done the best I can to you know provide some ways forward, concrete ways forward. At the end of the day, there is a kindness, even though there's been hard talk. You know, offering the window into what we see in terms of that white uh, white supremacy asymmetric game. 
uh, sense, uh, offering the invitation to take on some of those pieces on our behalf because we're trying to make headway uh, and make it a truly uh, more symmetrical game, more multicultural space. That's not for you, at least when, you know, <laughs> sit this one out and interpret our side charitably, you know, either sit it out or learn and grow from it, just, you know, as opposed to that feelings-based resistance. All of that, any of that, would be really, really helpful. Or the response could be more defensiveness. You're still attacking. You're not making any sense. Uh, you know, here, here we go again, more wokeness, more blah, blah, blah. There can be a retrenchment and there could be a tuning up of that fear. And so that is what I'm going to talk about in the third video. I am under no illusions. Not a ton of people are going to watch this. It is going to continue to happen where we deal with triggered folks that now we're going beyond the, the nice modern white guy construction and towards folks who are triggered uh, and their feelings are triggered and their fears is actively triggered and it comes out in these forum debates. And so I'm going to directly address that in the third and final video in this series. So until next time, if you can change your mind, you can change the world. Hey, everybody.